no, if we're hurting ourselves or you know harming ourselves. And th the third aspect is that which has to deal with our ethical growth. If you look at um, Sunni Islam, I don't know if you have learned Sunni Islam in your class, you have, right? You see that they take uh, all of these three things from three different peoples, right? For example, they take their jurisprudence from a set of imams that they follow. They take their ideology from another, you know, uh, different set of people here and there, right? Which is the Ashaira and, you know, the Mu'tazila, right? And then when it came to their ethical and moral growth, neither the uh, jurisprudent imams nor the uh, uh, these other imams who taught ideology spoke about that or showed that. So then you have a whole set of people who are uh, helping them or training them for their ethical growth, for their moral growth. So uh, these are the Sufis that you're talking about. Now for Shias, they have no place because the Shias took everything, their jurisprudence, their ideology, and their moral growth from one set of Imams. So all of it came as one package and hence it works together. Because those came from different packages, different people, that's why they were at war with each other. You know, the the, the Fiqhi people, right, Mutakallameen, but we say, you know, the ideological people were always killing the Sufis, right, and so forth and so forth. It went on, the battles went on because they came from different sources. We gain all of that from one source and hence to us, all of that blends together. Uh, yes, and that's where you see uh, if a person does that, then he's unaware. He's unaware that he's going there without understanding what it means. Right? That's what we will say. He's unaware. Right? It doesn't mean that he's wrong. Right? He's just unaware. There's a better way. Yes. But there are still a few. A few that are Shias, right? And and that's where, you know, the idea of Sufism would, you know, like there's no such thing as Sufism in Shia Islam, but there are Shias who are Sufis. Let's put it that way. Because Shia Islam has no room for that because the moral growth and the spiritual growth are all defined by the same set of Imams. So there's uh, there's no room for anyone else to come and say that, okay, you know what, I'll teach you how to get to God. Yeah, and, uh, and on a personal note, what I have seen is that the, uh, the role of emotion, and emotional outlet in the Sunni tradition is often linked to Sufism, whereas in the Shia tradition, it's very much linked to Ahlbayt and devotion to the Holy Family. Right. You know, I mean, uh, yes, a, a need... Love, being loved, is a human need. It's a need for our soul, being loved. And that's why, for example, the emphasis or God's way of training us is to first show that He loves us. And as a tangible uh, expression of that love is what Ahlul Bayt are. They're the tangible expression of God's love for us. They loved us. And hence through that, we gain that moral standard, that moral compass, right? Knowing that we have been loved. Yes? No, it's the same thing, right? Uh, you see, God is a creator uh, by nature, by essence. God creates, creates on. <laughs>
ألم يروا كما هلكنا قبلهم من القرون أنهم إليهم لا يرجعون وإن كل لما جميع لدينا محضرون وآية لهم الأرض الميتة أحييناها وأخرجنا منها حبا فمنه يأكلون وجعلنا فيها جنات من نخيل وأعناب وفجرنا فيها من العيون ليأكلوا من ثمره وما عملته أيديهم أفلا يشكرون سبحان الذي خلق الأزواج كلها مما تنبت الأرض ومن أنفسهم ومما لا يعلم وآية لهم الليل نسلخ منه النهار فإذا هم مظلمون والشمس تجري لمستقر لها ذلك تقدير العزيز العليم والقمر قدرناه منازل حتى عاد كالعرجون القديم للشمس ينبغي لها أن تدرك القمر ولا الليل سابق النهار وكل في فلك يسبحون وآية لهم أنا حملنا ذريتهم في الفلك المشحون وخلقنا لهم من مثله ما يركبون وإن نشأ نغرقهم فلا صريخ لهم ولا هم ينقذون إلا رحمة منا ومتاعا إلى حين وإذا قيل لهم اتقوا ما بين أيديكم وما خلفكم لعلكم ترحمون وما تأتيهم من آية من آيات ربهم إلا كانوا عنها معرضين وإذا قيل لهم أنفقوا مما رزقكم الله قال الذين كفروا للذين آمنوا أنطعم من لو يشاء الله أطعمه إن أنتم إلا في ضلال مبين ويقولون متى هذا الوعد إن كنتم صادقين ما ينظرون إلا صيحة واحدة تأخذهم وهم يخصمون فلا يستطيعون توصية ولا إلى أهلهم يرجعون ونفخ في الصور فإذا هم من الأجداس إلى ربهم ينسلون قالوا يا ويلنا من بعثنا من مرقدنا هذا ما بعد الرحمن وصدق المرسلون إن كانت إلا صيحة واحدة فإذا هم جميع لدينا محضرون 
فاليوم لا تظلم نفس شيئا ولا تجزون إلا ما كنتم تعملون إن أصحاب الجنة اليوم في شغل فاكهون هم وأزواجهم في ظلال على الأرائك متكئون لهم فيها فاكهة ولهم ما يدعون سلام قولا من رب الرحيم وامتاز اليوم أيها المجرمون ألم أعهد إليكم يا بني آدم أن لا تعبدوا الشيطان إنه لكم عدو مبين وأن اعبدوني هذا صراط مستقيم ولقد ضل منكم جبلا كثيرا أفلم تكونوا تعقلون هذه جهنم التي كنتم توعدون إسلوح إسلوح اليوم بما كنتم تكفرون اليوم نختم على أفواههم وتكلمنا أيديهم وتشهد أرجلهم بما كانوا يكسبون ولو نشاء لطمسنا على أعينهم فاستبقوا الصراط فأنا يبصرون ولو نشاء لمسخناهم على مكانتهم فما استطاعوا مضيا ولا يرجعون ومن نعمره ننكسه في الخلق فلا يعقلون وما علمناه الشعر وما ينبغي له إن هو إلا ذكر وقرآن مبين لينذر من كان حيا ويحق القول على الكافرين أولم يروا أنا خلقنا لهم مما عملت أيدينا أنعاما فهم لها مالكون وذللناها لهم فمنها ركوبهم ومنها يأكلون ولهم فيها منافع ومشارب فلا يشكرون واتخذوا من دون الله آلهة لعلهم ينصرون لا يستطيعون نصرهم وهم لهم جند محضرون فلا يحزنك قولهم إنا نعلم ما يسرون وما يعلنون أولم ير الإنسان أنا خلقناه من نطفة فإذا هو خصيم مبين وضرب لنا مثلا ونسي خلقه قال من يحيي العظام وهي رميم قل يحييها الذي أنشأها أول مرة وهو بكل خلق عليم الذي جعل لكم من الشجر الأخضر نارا فإذا أنتم منه توقدون أوليس الذي خلق السماوات والأرض بقادر على أن يخلق مثلهم بلى وهو الخلاق العليم إنما أمره إذا أراد شيئا أن يقول له كن فيكون فسبحان الذي بيده ملكوت كل شيء وإليه ترجعون صدق الله العلي العظيم
they ask for some fatah, if you please recite Surah Fatah for Marhum Ali Eskurechi and Marhum Manaoud Aziz. Thank you. Salawat ala Muhammad. Assalamu alaikum, dear brothers and sisters. May Allah accept all your amal or your, 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 your mornings, hazadaris, and these, these uh, days and months of Muharram and Safar. Just want to give a quick reminder uh, this weekend, so tonight, tomorrow night, and Saturday night, we have a similar program as tonight, starting with Maghreb and Aisha. In between, we have Ziyarat Ashura, then Tabarruk. And then uh, speech uh, at uh, 8.15, inshallah. Uh, and also uh, another reminder that this program uh, is the same for the months of Muharram and Safar all the way to the end. We're going to have on the weekends, which is Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday night, speeches. Except for this weekend, all other weekends we're going to have the parallel programs in different languages, inshallah. Tonight, uh, we're blessed to have uh, Mulana Baig. He's, uh, he's uh, our guest for these three nights coming uh, all the way from Los Angeles, inshallah. We'll invite him uh, with a loud salawat. Please note down these names, uh, Marhum Ali Skuruchi and Marhuma Manute Aziz. Please recite a Surah Fatiha for them. Husband Allah, Nekmal Wakil, Nekmal Mawla, and Nekmal Nasir, Aoud Billah, and Minash Shaitan. In was Salato, was Salam, Allah, Ashraf, and Ambiya, and Wal Mursaleen, Sayyidina, and Mawlana, Abil Qasim, Muhammad. وَعَلَىٰ آلِهِ الطَّيِّبِينَ الطَّاهِرِينَ الْمَعْسُومِينَ <clears throat> To say that Islam is not against having fun or enjoyment or seeking pleasure even though it's true is deficient and it's lacking. If I ask you the question, is Islam against us having fun? What would be the answer? No, right? Has anyone said Islam is against us having fun and enjoying? So Islam is okay with us having fun, right? People really, even when I ask this question, you are thinking about it. Is Islam allowing us to have fun? Does Islam stop us to have fun? You see, this question, this, this thinking shows that people are still in doubt regarding this subject that I want to talk about. I don't know how far I'll get, but we want to discuss this subject of enjoyment, of fun, of pleasure. In Arabic, lazat. Where does lazat and pleasure fall into Islam? To say that Islam is not against fun is an understatement. It's really an understatement. Because the fact is 
Not only Islam is okay with you having fun, but the question Allah is asking is why aren't you having more fun? Allah is asking this question. Why aren't you having more fun? Why aren't you enjoying more? Why aren't you seeking more pleasure? And this is where we want what we want to understand. A lot of people really go ahead. A lot of people really do not have because they don't have the correct understanding of Islamic ideology when it comes to basic fundamental things that have to do with our human needs. Because of that, they are not able to build a relationship with Allah. They're not able to build a relationship that is lasting or enduring. Any relationship we build, you see that the time of little hardships and difficulties, you see that relationship goes away. It fills away out there. Many times when we look at this, it is something that we all need to think about. Why is this happening? Why aren't we able to build a relationship with Allah? Well, this is something that I want to answer also through this subject. So let's send a salawat. Really, Islam, the question Islam asks in regards to enjoyment is why are, not, why are you not having more fun in your life? Why aren't you enjoying your existence more? Allah is not stopping you from having fun. In fact, Allah is insisting that you have fun. Allah is insisting that you enjoy. And now we think about that because many idols that we have formed in our mind regarding religion, I just want to break them. Why? Because I want us to have a true meaningful relationship with Allah. The way Allah wanted us to have it. We heard about religion in so many ways. But when we looked at it, we all came down to the same conclusion that Allah is stopping us from having fun over here. And He doesn't want us to enjoy. And that's what Islam is. Be serious in your life. Don't be having fun. Because that's what Islam is. And when we came to that conclusion, Shaitan found a way to call us away from Islam. So now all Shaitan needs to do is say that, listen, Allah is stopping you from having fun. Allah is saying no enjoyment, no pleasure, no lazat, nothing like that. So guys, here it is. Why don't you come to me? This is where the party is. Okay? This is where the party is. And for people, it's like, yeah, I mean, you know, I want to enjoy. And this is the wrong concept of Islam that we have made known amongst ourselves. This, is, this enjoyment and this pleasure, seeking pleasure, is to such an extent that it is said that if you do not have pleasure or fun or enjoyment, I'm just translating the word lazat here, because that's my subject, lazat. If, you don't, uh, if you're not seeking lazat even for a moment, even for a moment, that moment you have broken your relationship with Allah. <coughs> See how important this is. Even for a moment, if you're not seeking lazat and pleasure, it's as if you have broken your relationship with Allah and your spiritual growth has stopped. Even for a moment. La ilaha illallah. You look at that and you're like, even for a moment, Meaning that Allah wants us to have pleasure in everything we do? Yes. And then also He wants to increase your pleasure. So, you know, obviously by now you might be thinking, you know, where did we get this Maulana from? <laughs> right? And some of you are thinking, he's our type of Maulana. Right? <laughs> 
there you go. <laughs> so we're talking about entertainment. We're talking about fun and enjoyment. That's what we're talking about. And it is such an important subject that I will just reveal to you right now in this speech. And the next two days we'll discuss a little bit deeper regarding this. How important this is in order to maintain our relationship with Allah. In order to maintain our relationship with Imam Hussein. If you are not seeking pleasure, meaning actively seeking pleasure and lazat, then you do not and cannot form a relationship with Imam Hussein. Far be it from establishing one with Allah. And this is where now, I just want to raise the subject up today. I'm not going to answer any questions. I know you will have questions. And I just beg of you to wait for the next two days so that then you can ask questions after some answers are given forward. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. My brothers and sisters, seeking enjoyment and pleasure is so important in Islam that Islam has made it a character of a believer and a mu'min that he, not only should he be having fun, but he should make the people who are around him enjoy also. A mu'min is someone that people take pleasure from his company. When a believer is around, people enjoy his pleasure. They, 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 just his company, just him being around is pleasurable. This is the akhlaq of Islam. Imagine how important this is. You, we are told to live happy and make others happy. We are told to live with a high spirit so that when others see us, their spirits can be raised high. This is how we as a mu'min are advised to live by the Prophet and the Imams. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Friends, we pray and fast and do all these things for what? For Jannat? Say yes and make my life easier. <laughs> We're doing it for Jannat, right? You know, uh, you know, some of you might be really high up there, more than me, you know, so you might be saying, Jannat, nah, what's Jannat? You know, I'm doing it for Allah. But, you know, I'm talking about normal people like me. Right? Uh, we're doing it for Jannat. We're doing it for heaven. My friends, why are you, why do you want to go to heaven? Why is paradise so important for you? What are you going to get there in paradise? Allah has stated many of these things, right? And, you know, uh, food the way you want it. You know, really, not like Burger King, right? <laughs> really the way you want it. Right? Uh, anything that you wish for, Hurul Eeen, all of these things. My friends, what are you going to get out of that? What are all these things meant for? What are they feeding? Think about it. If you get a hurul in, what is that hurul in making you have? Imagine this. Is it, isn't it pleasure? Isn't that what Allah wants to give you in heaven? More pleasure? Upgraded pleasure? Real type of pleasure? That's what He wants to give you, right? It's pleasure. Admit it. Yes, it's pleasure. Allah is saying, I will give you the food you like. Why Allah? To please you. So that you can enjoy it. I'll give you hurulin. Why? So that you can enjoy it. So all of the heaven and whatever's in heaven is there in order that we enjoy it. That we gain more pleasure from it. Isn't that the case or not? Or does anyone want a hurul in for uh, suffering? Difficulty? <laughs> I want one hurul in who's going to give me a headache. <laughs> we already have that here in dunya, right? <laughs> you don't want that one there, right? So here it is. You know, 
all of that is in Jannah is there for what? It's there so that we enjoy. More than that, we are going to meet Allah, our Creator, our Rabb. Of course, I'm not saying see, I'm saying meet, mulaqat, lika'ullah. You can explain to him, brother, you know, a little bit, alright? He says, no, mulaqat, I'm saying mulaqat, brother, not ra'ayta, right? Mulaqat, lika'ullah. Right? Allah says, you know, Alladina Allah, those who are going to meet Allah. Right? So we are going to meet Allah. La ilaha illallah. We'll go through the Quran. I'll give you the ayat afterwards. At the end of the questions at the end, right? You can ask me, inshallah. I'll, I'll take that down. I'll take it down. No problem, right? So as you heard the brother, we're not going to see Allah. You all got that? Good. We're going to meet Allah. Right? So now when we meet Allah, what is the meeting for? What do you want to get out of it? We are all going to stand before Allah. On the day of judgment, we're all going to stand. What is it for? What is it for you? Really, what do you think of Allah? Are you going to Him so that He can take account of you? Do you view him as a judge? As a policeman? Who is there to arrest you for all the wrongs you have done? What is your relationship with Allah? Tell me. What is your relationship with Allah? What do you think of Allah? What is your view about Allah? Sometimes. Ar Rahman, Rahim. Ar Very good. Ar Rahman, Ar Rahim. Let's translate that. What does that mean? My friends, a lot of us read that in the Quran, but we don't, we don't really grasp the meaning. Are you going on the day of judgment so that you can be judged? That Allah is going to be there and you're like afraid of Him. My friends, if you have this perception of Allah, where does Rahman and Rahim fall in? Really? That's for those who are not believers. You who believe and love Imam Hussein and cry for the sons of Fatima, you should have a different take on Allah. You should have a different view of Allah. Your idea of who is God and who is Allah should be much different than, you know what, Allah is going to catch me on the day of judgment. Do you really think that's how Allah is? That He's just waiting there to catch you so that He can punish you? My friends, if you understood Allah, then you would be waiting for that day when you can stand before Him and say, Allah, I was waiting to see your love and my love being translated and manifested and expressed. This is what it is. My friends, you are going there so you can get the pleasure out of Allah's being there. This is how important pleasure is. Why did Allah create you? Why did Allah create us? Look, Abudu, exactly. So, do you think that Allah created us so we can bump heads and go up and down and be troubled? Is that why Allah, Allah, you, so Rahman and Rahim created me for what? So that I can go through trouble? Did He want to give us trouble? Annoy us? Make our life cumbersome? My friends, I want you to think here. I'm just raising the subject so that we can start thinking. Do not just go and read ayat and hadith without thinking. It will not really will not be the right way of doing things. Much of our souls, is, our aql is required to learn and understand. Islam is a very refined religion. It's very refined. It's so delicate. It's so subtle. It's so beautiful that every little 
aspect of it, when we understand it, then our relationship with Allah will truly begin to blossom. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. La ilaha illallah. Yes, my friends, all of this, we have been created, Allah has created us for lazat, for pleasure, so that we can reach the height of lazat that comes through ibadat, that come, these are means. But the real goal, Allah wants us, I created you so that you can have more fun. That can, you can enjoy your existence. And you know what? Here's the thing. For those who are young and are learning this at this stage, because some might be old and saying that, you know, why didn't I hear this when I was young? Right? But, hey, listen, you know, uh, even if you're old, it doesn't matter. You're still young at heart, right? Isn't that right? So, let's hear that then. Let's hear a loud salawat. This is the reason why there is no restriction on enjoyment. Does Islam restrict your enjoyment? We see that no. There is no restriction. How much can you enjoy? It is unlimited. And you must be wondering, how is it unlimited? But Islam had said, all of these things are haram and this and that. Yes. And that inshallah I hope I can come to. To explain where does haram fall into this world view. And this is from where we learn. My friends, there is no restrictions. Any one of you who says enough, I had enough enjoyment in my life, that person really hasn't built a relationship with Allah. If he had built a relationship with Allah, he would never say that because Allah is asking, why are you saying that you had enough fun? I want you to have more. I want you to increase your enjoyment. Why are you saying this to yourself? Why are you making such small goals for yourself? Make higher goals, make greater goals, have more fun and seek more enjoyment and pleasure. This is how Allah is dealing with you. And we need, we are not cows. You know, cows, cattle, sheep, we're not cows. They are much simpler than us. To them, the greatest moment of their day is to smell some good grass and eat it. Right? A cow goes around smelling grass and whatever grass it likes, it starts eating, you know? And that's like the highlight of its day. <laughs> you know? Some of us got, you know, some of us might get a kick out of grass, but other than that, <laughs> leaving that aside, I'm saying we are more complex than that. We're more complex than that. We are better than that. Allah created us to be better. You know, in the old days when I played video games, when I was playing video games, it's much different than video games nowadays. I don't see any kids over here. I hear them in the other hall, you know. But if they were here, they would understand this, right? Maybe some of you uh, still watch the kids play games, right? If you watch to play them games, these games are very sophisticated nowadays. I mean, they're so exciting, so many challenges, so many things that are happening all around in that game. You see, my friends, in those days, we would get a game, you know, when I was young, and you would just have a car, and just you're driving in that car, you know, and you're driving, you know, in like 5 minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, and, you know, after a while, you'll say, this is retarded, you know, <laughs> what am I doing? <laughs> like, like, completely retarded, has nothing to do with anything, and you see these these games, no challenges, nothing. My friends, if the, the game becomes better when there's a challenge. You're being shot at, you're being this, you have to dodge, you have to wave, you have to do things. Doing that makes the game exciting. That's where the excitement comes from, that's where the enjoyment comes from, that's where the fun comes from. That's why Allah has Uh, 
Lahwan wa la'ib. This life of this world is nothing but a game. Nothing but a game. Don't take it seriously. Enjoy it. Have fun with it. What do you do with a game? Do you take a game uh, seriously? Have you seen someone who takes a game like for example so seriously that you know he's angry? That's what happens, right? You know, I mean, uh, you go to these little league games over there. I mean, the parents are more serious than the children, right? They're getting angry, shouting, cursing, and all these things. And why are you getting so serious about it? It's only a game. It's only a game. Why are you getting so uptight about this? Relax. That's what Allah is saying. He's saying this life of this world is only a game. Just take it easy. Enjoy it. The whole idea of a game is to enjoy it. That's why the challenges of life are there. The purpose of why Allah gives us difficulties and sufferings and hardships in our life is to make the game and life more exciting and enjoyable for you. That's why he makes it more enjoy. He makes it enjoyable through these things. It's just that we don't look at it that way. If we understood that life is a game, we would be enjoying all the curveballs that life is throwing at us. We would be having fun with it. But because we don't view our life like that, you know, I mean, you ask people, you know, I mean, you know, really, even life, you know, what life is. If you ask a kid what life is, the kid says, you know, it's fun, you know. And your know, dad is like, uh, shut up, you know, it's not fun, be serious. Now, actually, the kid is right. <laughs> You're not right. You, the parent, are not right by saying it's serious. Allah is saying it's fun. Why are you saying it's serious? You see, from here, understand how things work in Islam. Islam is a sophisticated religion. It's not for naive people, simple-minded people who just want to view it and read a hadith and, you know, this is what Imam said, without understanding the undertones and the depth of where it applies in our life and how it applies in our life. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. My friends, I'm just talking, I'm, I'm introducing the subject. I haven't even gone into it yet. Right? The importance of pleasure. What is pleasure? My friends, having fun, just let me tell you this. It is so important that we owe it to Allah to have fun in our life. You owe Him. Any minute that you don't have fun, really, any moment that you are not enjoying your life is a moment to do istighfar and say, Allah, I'm sorry, I did not enjoy. It's do istighfar there. Ask Allah, please forgive me for not enjoying, for not having fun. La ilaha illallah. We owe it to Allah to have fun. You know, let me give an example so we understand this better. Send a salawat, please. There's not a lot of time for me, you know, uh, because of the fact that this introduction is long. And uh, so I'm just going to uh, cut it off abruptly. One example I'll give you so you understand what I just said. You owe Allah to have fun. What does that mean? You know what it means? It means this, my friends. Let's say that you take your children to Disney or any other theme park, right? I don't know what theme park is around here. Anyone knows? Six Flags. Six Flags. Very good. Six Flags. There you go. Six Flags. You take your children to Six Flags. Tell me, why do you take your children to Six Flags? So that they can be bored or sad, gloomy, to have fun, right? You take them to Six Flags to have fun. So now as your children are there in Six Flags and you paid big bucks to get in there, right? You paid big bucks to get in there, right? And you know, you go there to Six Flags and they go there and you're like with them. Now tell me, if your child is unhappy, if your child has a sad face, what would you be asking him or her? In Six Flags, you brought them there so that they can have fun and then your child is sad and gloomy and all upset. 
What will be your natural question? Why aren't you happy? I brought you here to be happy. I brought you here to enjoy. Why aren't you enjoying? My friends, understand this. Allah brought us in this dunya to have enjoyment. Any time that you are sad, that is the question Allah is asking you. Why aren't you happy? Have I not done enough for you? Why aren't you happy? I brought you here for fun. Why are you all so upset, serious, and angry? Really, I brought you here so that you can enjoy. You know, I will uh, just read a hadith from Imam Ali and I'll go to the Masaib, right? Because we don't have that much time. Just uh, one hadith, you know, this is a khutbah, uh, this is a letter that Imam Ali alayhi salam wrote to Muhammad ibn Abu Bakr, who he had appointed as a governor to Egypt. Imam Ali wrote this, and this is in Nahj Balagha, and here he says, Wa'alamu ibad Allah. He says, No, O oh, servants of Allah, Anna al muttaqeen that the muttaqeen, who is he talking about now? The muttaqeen. Who are the muttaqeen? The pious, God fearing. Right? Now, whatever image you had of a muttaqi person, this khutma is going to destroy that. Whatever image you had of a muttaqi, this khutbah that Imam Ali is giving is going to destroy that for you. Here he says that ذَهَبُوا بِعَاجِلِ الدُّنْيَا وَعَاجِلِ الْآخِرَةِ They are leaving this world and are going to the next world. Meaning that they are living their lives and they're going and they're passing their lives. فَشَارَكُوا أَهْلَ الدُّنْيَا فِي دُنْيَاهُمْ They share the dunya with ahlul dunya. The people of dunya, you see them sharing dunya with them. وَلَمْ يُشَارِكْهُمْ أَهْلُ الدُّنْيَا فِي آخِرَتِهِمْ But the people of dunya are not going to share their akhirat. But the dunya, they share with Ahlul dunya. You know, you said, someone said Hollywood, right? They're Ahlul dunya. And you share the world with them. So now, Imam, what are you trying to say? Now he goes forward. Again, as I said, I'm just going to translate. I wanted to explain it, but inshallah, you know, tomorrow I'll see if I could. Or we'll move forward, right? Now Imam says, regarding who? The pious people. He said that they share the dunya with ahl dunya with the people of dunya, right? And then he says, Sakunu dunya bi ma sukinat. Muttaqi people are the ones who live in the best houses. Best houses. You will see, go around, see the best house, you will see the muttaqi person is living there. No way. You decide that, right? I want to see you this. Just listen to what Imam Ali is saying in his description of who a muttaqi person is, describing it to Muhammad ibn Abu Bakr in his instructions there. Understand this. Then he, he doesn't stop there. Okay, good house. Uh, I should have a good house now. And they eat the best food better than them. They eat the best food better than them. And they wear the best clothes. They wear the best clothes. And even second, no, oh, the best ones. You see the best, most well-dressed person, that's the muttaqi person. Imagine what our idea of a muttaqi person was. And how Imam explains this. That's the reason we need to learn from the Imams what the meaning of these things is. And he goes forward. He didn't stop there, right? They have the best wives. The spouses. I want to keep it both gender, right? They have the best spouses. Better than kuffar. Better than ahlul dunya. Their spouses are better. They get more pleasure from them. They enjoy more from each other. Then he says, They have the best cars. He says rides right, here. I'm just translating into our language, right? They have the best rides. Better rides than Ahl dunya do. And now you must be wondering, okay, Imam Ali, this is a whole different description of what a muttaqi person is. 
that we thought of. My friends, now a lot of you might be asking, but Imam Ali didn't live this way. Did Imam Ali live like this? No, he didn't. Right? He didn't. I mean, he used to wear rough clothes. You know, he used to live very simple and all of that. And you might be wondering, but Moana, you're saying that, how is it possible? How is it possible? La ilaha illallah. You see, this is where we need to learn ideology. Someone asked Imam Jafar as Sadiq alayhi salam. Someone asked Imam, saying that, you know, looking at his clothes, because Imam was wearing, you know, good clothes. Really good clothes. He looked at Imam and said, look at you. Look at the clothes you're wearing, and look at the clothes that your grandfather wore. Imam Ali. He wore those type of lot, and you're wearing these type of clothes. Why aren't you following his example? Why aren't you following his example? Now, before what the Imam said to you, right? Let me just... You know, uh, an example I'll give you, right? What happened with me? You know, I was in Qom and I was invited by a very muttaqi alim to come and, you know, eat lunch with him. So I went there, lunch with him, you know. So, you know, he had made like, you know, a chicken dish uh, with rice and all of that. And for me, and for him, he had a hard barley bread. You know, the hard barley bread. You know, he had that. And I was like, uh, I said, why are you eating that? He says, I'm following the sunnah of Imam Ali. I'm eating hard barley bread. I said, Alhamdulillah, you know, I went for the chicken, you know. <laughs> I went for the chicken. I said, you know, that's too delicious. Man. Let me just take that. You take the barley bread and enjoy that, right? Now, while I was eating the chicken, then he went on to explain about the barley bread. He says, nowadays it's very hard to get this barley. There's only one person who makes it and it's very expensive. <laughs> and I looked at him and said, bro, I think you missed the whole point. <laughs> Imam Ali did not eat the barley bread for that. It's because that was the only thing that was found. Not that it's a delicacy now and you have to buy it from one person who makes it. You know, it's more, more expensive than the chicken. <laughs> You know, I think you're missing the boat on the whole idea of what Imam Ali is trying to do here. So a lot of times we take these things without the context and we make mistakes in applying it into our life. So when he asked Imam Sadiq, now look at the answer of Imam Sadiq. That's where the interesting part is. The answer of Imam Sadiq, he said that, listen, my father, my grandfather, meaning Imam Ali, he... Wore, used to wear those clothes because of the fact that he was a leader of the people and they were looking up to him and he had to live a simple life in order they can access him without feeling ashamed. You think, without feeling ashamed. He is the leader. People are looking up to him. They are going for their needs to him. Not just the Imam, he was the Khalifa of the time. And that's why people were going up to him. They were a direct contact he had with people. And he needed to be accessible to them. If he rode in high horses and lived in grand uh, houses, obviously people will feel ashamed. Oh, you know, I mean, to me, for me to go there, who am I? They will feel ashamed to go in front of them. My friends, did you understand what Imam Sadiq just did? You see, still we haven't understood what he had done. Then you will appreciate the answer that Imam is giving. Imam justified the actions of Imam Ali. He did not justify his own actions. In other words, what Imam Ali is doing is due to circumstances. What Imam Sadiq was doing is the norm. Understand that. You see this. That's how you learn. What Imam Ali was doing was because of the circumstances he was in, he was like that. Otherwise, Imam Ali would be like me also. If there was no circumstances like that. You see, this is how you look into things. And for us, when we look at what muttaqi is, do not, and this is where we make the mistake. Imam Ali, when he's explaining that, he says, enjoy. And this enjoyment is necessary for us. It is who we are. Really who we are. 
And those who enjoy, they actually have a relationship with Allah. Really. <sighs> La ilaha illallah. You know, as I said, right? We will, uh, I'll just stop over here. You know, when Allah created you, He created you keeping your needs in mind. Keeping your needs in mind. Pleasure is a need that we have. It's a need. You cannot separate it from us. That's why those people who try to fight pleasure, they're fighting a futile battle. An unwinnable battle that they're fighting. You don't defeat pleasure. Allah made pleasure in order that we reach the height of pleasure. So when He created us, now Allah actually cares for our need. He actually cares. When Allah is asking you, how are you? Then it's really He asking you how you are. It's like a mother. You see, if a child, if a child is hungry, tell me who feels the pain more, the child or the mother? The father. You see, mothers and fathers, they lose their patience when their children are hungry. Right away, they, they feel it. I feel that, right? More than... If he sees us going through pain and difficulty, what, you think Allah is looking at us and saying, you know, good? Though, my friends, it's he who's feeling it more. Really? This is how, who Allah is. When we have the right understanding of who Allah is, then we will truly have a relationship with him. He actually cares. He actually cares about us a lot. Maybe we don't care about him that much, but he actually cares about us. And that should reinforce ourselves to know that I'm cared for. Let's look at someone who was a person who who knew what pleasure was you knew who was pleasure was you know Imam Hussein is Fatima's sweetheart Imam Hussein is precious to Bibi Fatima very precious he was so precious that you know that really when when she was on her deathbed and giving her will to Imam Ali. She had made a mention of Imam Hussein and said, Ali, be very careful of my son Hussein. Very careful of my son Hussein. Be very careful of him. Take care of him. He's going to miss me a lot. Take care of him. Yes, Imam Hussein became a refugee in the desert. And you know what a refugee is in a desert, unwanted, where no one is caring for you, no one wants you. You know how that feels? Imam Hussein went through that. You know that, right? You know, when, when um, Omar ibn Asad, when he gave the order to trample the bodies in Karbala, you know, because that's the ultimate humiliation. You want to put someone through humiliation, that's what you do. You trample their bodies. You trample their bodies is a, signal, is a symbol that he is helpless, he is unwanted, and he is a vagabond that no one cares for. That's the sign of that. So when he ordered that, you see, the tribe of Hur right away stood up and said, Listen, you have killed a whore, but we will not allow you to do this disgrace to his body. And they stood up. And they wanted to fight Umar ibn Asad. And you know what? He said, alright, alright, I'm not here to fight anymore. You can take his body away. So those people took the body of whore away from there. And then some other people stood up. Habib's people stood up and said, No, we will not allow you to trample Habib's body. Alright, you go ahead also. Take his body. 
Then he made a general announcement to make things easier. He said, listen, anyone who wants to claim anybody in Karbala, in this battlefield, go ahead and come and claim it. Everyone started claiming their bodies. Everyone, I mean. I mean everyone. On one hand, you see that even Abbas was taken away. Even Ali Akbar was taken away by his mother's side. His mother's side of the family, they said, No, you cannot trample Ali Akbar. He is from our tribe. Let's take him. He said, All right, take him away. Take him away. After everyone was taken away, it is said in the Riwayah that the only body that was unclaimed in the Ummah of Muhammad was the body of Imam Hussein. Your only party. Can you believe that? No one in this Ummah wanted to claim the body of Imam Hussain. So he said, now trample this body. <laughs> Imam Hussain, that, that's how lonely he was there. He's the unwanted he was there. You know, Imam Hussain, that Imam Hussain, you know, imagine this. What has Imam Hussain done to us? Really, have you looked at yourself and saw what Hussain has done to you? Yes, it's true, his family has become homeless. It's true, his family have become homeless. But did you notice the homes that they, that they have made in our hearts? Look at the homes that the family of Hussain has made in our hearts. And from there you'll start to appreciate it. My friends, you cried for the son of Fatima. Fatima is grateful to you. Baby Fatima is grateful to you because you cried for Hussein and you shed tears for Imam Hussein and she is grateful to you. But Imam Hussein, I want you to ask yourself, you cried, you spent yourself, you beat yourself, you did all of these things in the 10 days that have gone by. Tell me, is there anyone who's thinking that you have done enough for Imam Hussein? Is there anyone who feels that that is sufficient? That now I paid back what I owe to Imam Hussain? Is there anyone who feels like that here? And of course I would say no. No one feels like that here. Doesn't everyone feel that you are indebted to Imam Hussain? Don't you feel that, that you are indebted to Imam Hussain? And that your heads are bowed down saying, Imam, who said, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that I fell short of your glory. I fell short of your greatness. You gave so much. You gave so much and I haven't given anything back to you. We feel sorry. We feel ashamed. We feel indebted to Imam Hussain. All I will say to you is this. Raise your head up. Raise your head up and walk with dignity and walk with pride. You know why? Because everyone has fallen short of Imam Hussain. Everyone in Karbala has fallen short of Imam Hussain. Don't you see Abbas who's falling down in Karbala is saying, Hussain, I'm sorry, Hussain. I'm sorry I could not have done this for you. I fell short of you. You had expectations from me and I fell short of those expectations. If Abbas is sorry in front of Hussain, if Abbas falls short in front of Hussain, then who are you? No one can leave Imam Hussain indebted, my friends. No one can leave Imam Hussain indebted. You know how, how Imam Hussain is and who Imam Hussain is? Let me tell you who Imam Hussain is. Everyone in Karbala was indebted to Imam Hussain. They gave their life for Hussain, but they owed Imam Hussain. Because Hussain gave them more than what they had given him. If you are crying today, right now, you can betcha that Hussain is going to give you more than what you have given him. Hussein is going to give you more than what you have given. Hussein never leaves anyone short-handed. Hussein has made everyone indebted to Hussein except for one person. Except for one person that Hussein falls short of that person. That Hussein, Hussein is indebted to that person. You know who that person is? Who has made Hussein indebted? Who has made Hussein fall short? That's his sister Zainab al 
Zainab. Zainab is someone who truly, Hussain is saying Zainab without you. Where would Hussain be Zainab? I am grateful to you. It is Zainab who has done that. That's why many places we have seen the comparison between Karbala and Sham. But when asked from Imam Sajjad, what is the hardest place? What is the most difficult time? Three times he said, a Sham, a Sham, a Sham. Three times he said, a Sham. You know why? He then explains it. They ask Mala, why do you say that? Why is it that Sham is more difficult to deal with than Karbala? Because in Karbala, your loved ones died. What happened in Sham? Imam, this is from Imam now. I'm quoting Imam Sajjad saying this. Imam Sajjad says that there are certain things that happened in Sham that were unbearable that we were not able to handle, that it was so difficult for us. Imam Sajjad is saying this, the first thing was that we were taken as a group of prisoners in Sham, and the guards were surrounding us, the guards had surrounded us with spears in their hands, and they were poking us in the middle. They were striking with the spears to get us huddled into one group. <laughs> second thing, Imam Sajjad is saying, second thing that happened in Sham that was devastating for Ahlul Bayt is that the heads of the Shahada were placed between the women and children. Were placed between the women and children, the heads were standing there. You know what that means? When the children were crying and they saw their father, the mother wasn't there to hold them and give them comfort. What can I say, my friends? How far can I go with this? The third thing Imam said, the third thing that happened in Sham that was unbearable is that from morning till night, from morning till night, we were being paraded in the streets of Sham. We were being paraded in the streets of Sham, and they had appointed a person in front of us who would be saying and shouting out loud, Kill them! Kill them! <laughs> and the children and women would hear that, this person saying, Kill them! And they would look at him and say, What did we do to deserve to be killed? <laughs> And the fourth thing that the Imam said, I will not say it to the end. Inshallah, you raise your voices so that you don't let me, you don't let my voice reach you. You know what the Imam is saying? As we were going in the streets, Imam is saying this, when we were going in the streets, the people were standing on their roofs and they were throwing fire at us. They were throwing coal, burning coal and fire at us. And this fire was coming from all around and one piece of that fire fell on my head a piece of that fire fell on my head and because my hands were tied say alam alladheena zalamu ayyamun qalbin yanqalabu يا محمود بحكي محمد يا الله بحكي علي فاطرة بحكي فاطر السماوات بحكي فاطمة يا محسن بحكي حسن يا قديم الأحسان بحكي حسين Allah give us the tawfiq to be on the right path give us the wisdom to understand your guidance increase the love of أهل البيت in our hearts and in the hearts of our children Make our feet firm on the path of Ahlul Bayt. Give the strength in our arms so that we can hold up the flag of Islam. O oh Allah, we ask you to hasten the reappearance of our Imam. We ask you to make us his helper when he comes. Waqirud Davana and Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Now, say. Yahusen, 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 Yahus
في التفوف تسبى زينب للعين في تسبى زينب للعين وتنادي عين عنت يا معيني وهسينا 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 وحسينا في التفوف تسبى زينب للعين وتنادي أين أنت يا مويني وحسينا 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 Wahusaina, when in Karbala, the soldiers of Yazid shackled Zainab. When in Karbala, the soldiers of Yazid shackled Zainab. Choking back her tears, she cried out in pain. Where are you, Hussein? Where are you, Hussein? Wahabiba, 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 Wahusaina. وحسينا وحسينا في التفوف تسبى زينب للعين وتنادي أين أنت يا مويني وحسينا 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 Why your body lay trampled and slain lifeless on the sand By your body lay trampled and slain Lifeless on the sand, and your holy head thrust the top of spear, severed by Shimmer's hand, severed by Shimmer's hand. Wakatila, 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 Wahusaina, 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 Fitufufi, Tusba Zaina, Lilaini, Watunadi, Aina Anta. يا مويني وحسينا 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 You gave everything in a strange land to bring back true Islam You gave everything in a strange land to bring back true Islam your Quran in red, we who heed your call will never be misled, will never be misled. Wa gariba, wa gariba, wa gariba, wa husayna, wa husayna, wa husayna. Fi tufufi tusba zayna bilaini. وتنادي أين أنت يا مويني وحسينا 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 centuries away even here today your sacrifice lives on centuries away even here today your sacrifice lives on your light revives our hearts and guides us to your path where we're with you, O oh, Imam. We're with you, O oh, Imam. We're with you, O oh, Imam. Why, Imam? 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 Why, Hussein? Why, Hussein? Why, Hussein? Why, Hussein? Why, Hussein? وتنادي أين أنت يا مويني وحسينا 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 أبد والله يا زهرة ما ننسى حسينا أبد والله يا زهرة ما ننسى حسينا أبد والله يا زهرة ما ننسى حسينا أبد والله يا زهرة 
ما ننسى حسين ابدا والله يا زهراء 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 ما ننسى حسين لا اله الا الله لا اله الا الله محمد رسول الله لا اله الا الله لا اله الا الله محمد رسول الله لا اله الا الله لا اله الا الله محمد رسول الله لا اله الا الله لا اله الا الله محمد رسول الله علي ولي 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 الله نادي علي يا مال هلال عجائب نادي علي يا مال هلال عجائب تجد هو من لك في اللوائب كل هم وغم سينجلي كل هم وغم سينجلي بعزمتك يا الله بعزمتك يا الله بنبوتك يا محمد بنبوتك يا محمد برعايتك علي 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 صل على محمد وعلى محمد السلام عليك يا رسول الله يا حبيب الله يا خير خلق الله ورحمة الله وبركاته السلام عليك يا أبا عبد الله السلام عليك يا ابن رسول الله يا حسين أيها الشهيد بكربلاء السلام عليك وعلى جدك وأبيك وعلى أمك وأخيك جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته السلام عليك يا صاحب الأسر والزمان السلام عليك يا ماما نوائي ماما إنس والجان السلام عليك يا شريك القرآن السلام عليك يا مظهر الإيمان عجل الله تعالى فرجك وتهل الله تعالى مخرجك وظهورك السلام عليكم جميع المعصومين ورحمة الله وبركاته